consent for the release of my PowerPoint materials. I give permission and consent for the release of my PowerPoint materials. Is that on right now? Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, Yi Chung's not here. He's taking vacation in the middle of the summer. Think about it. So Yi Chung uh, said that, especially for the REUs and for the summer students, he wanted to make sure that he had a variety of speakers for the summer seminar series so that you could get some exposure to you know, the nonprofit, academic, state, and federal world of job opportunities because you're not just going to school because you love science, you're going to school because one day you're going to have a job. And today we're very uh, pleased to be able to have Dr. Lori Whitecamp as our speaker today. Uh, Lori has been working for the federal government for almost 25 years. I think you said you're two months short of your quarter century mark. So that's quite a landmark right there. Uh, Lori started working for NOAA in the, about 1992. She's been working on offshore salmon, Puget Sound salmon. She finally came to her senses in 2003, moved to Newport. She's been doing a tremendous amount of work in the Columbia River, uh, lower Columbia River, looking at juvenile salmonids and other anadromous fish like lampreys and their use of the lower river habitats as they're preparing to exit to go out into the ocean. The work that Lori does is incredibly important because everything we do, science is good, but you have to have a customer base. So her data, along with all of the other oceanographers and salmon biologists and fisheries biologists, comes together and then she has to communicate that to councils, commissions. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, last night she was meeting with tribal elders of Columbia River to talk about what are the impacts of some of the things she's going to discuss with us today. What are the impacts of those ocean conditions on future salmon returns? So her work not only has an impact on the management of these living marine resources, but also has a huge economic impact to tribes, commercial, recreational fishermen, landowners, water usage, all of those things. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Lori Whitecamp, our speaker for this afternoon's seminar. Thank you, Rick. And after an introduction like that, you can all go home now because it's all downhill. So uh, like several people in the room, I work for the Northwest Fishery Science Center. This is one of six regional, five regional science centers, six uh, across the country. So there's the Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, Southeast, Alaska, and Pacific, Hawaii and Pacific Islands. So NOAA Fisheries, which is part of NOAA, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has these science centers around US waters where we deal with marine species, including anatomist species. And for the Northwest and Alaska science centers, that's primarily Pacific salmon. So I am essentially a salmon biologist. What I'd like to do today is talk about salmon and give an update on the blob, El Nino, La Nina. For those of us working on salmon in the ocean, the last couple of years have been really, really exciting because the system is getting really shooken up. Um, so what I want to do is start out and talk first about Pacific salmon, who they are, what unifies them, what makes them different, talk a little bit about some of the research tools we use to do that, and then talk the second half of the talk about six issues that keep thousands of salmon biologists, such as myself, employed. And it's actually a pretty good gig, if you want to know the truth. Okay, so first off, why all the fuss about Pacific salmon? Why is everybody so excited? If you come from somewhere else in the country, you're going, God, these people are fixated on salmon. It is really the icon species for the Northwest and Alaska. This is why the Indians could sit around and build these amazing totem poles. Because these fish swam every year. They swam home to the streams that the Indians built their villages next to. And it provided this incredibly abundant food source. So they had a lot of extra time on their hands. Compare that to, say, a Plains Indian living in a teepee, moving around all the time, trying to catch up with their prey. Um, they're also important for our economy. The reason people came to the Northwest and to uh, Alaska was because of the salmon runs. It's a huge economic driver. And then ecologically, they're also really important, as I'll try and point out with you to you. Um, there's also great artwork with uh, salmon. Uh, 
My, one of my favorite artists is Ray Troll, who's up in Ketchikan, and I'll have quite a bit of his artwork. Um, and if you think people like me who are crazy about salmon uh, are crazy, we really are. So fish worship, it's about as close as it gets. Okay, so what are the Pacific salmon? Generally, there are six species. Some people don't count steelhead as Pacific salmon. I call them Pacific salmon. So we've got pink, sockeye, chum, coho, uh, chinook, and steelhead. They all have two names, just to make it complicated. And you can see with spawning adults, they all have very different colorations. When you look at them, when they're in their freshwater juvenile phase, so these are little tiny guys, they also look really different. But when you catch them out in the ocean, they more or less look the same, these shiny bodies that are designed to swim long distances. OK, so what unifies Pacific salmon? One of the big characteristics is that they're anadromous. So that means they spend most of their life out in the ocean, but they reproduce in fresh water. And the amount of time that they spend in either environment varies. And one of the advantages of going to the ocean is there's lots to eat out there, and you grow big. And that means that when you come back, you're bringing all these nutrients with, and you end up with really fertile creeks. And in fact, they've shown that streams that have salmon, the trees grow faster than streams that don't have salmon. They're next to them so that say have a, a waterfall that blocks access to it. So really important not only uh, to streams, but terrestrial uh, environments around the streams. Another advantage or, or characteristic of salmon is that they return to within meters of their birthplace. And this is really important for genetics, uh, as you will, I will show you. And they are semiparous, which means they die after spawning, except for some steelhead. Uh, this is actually really unique. Among fish, most fish spawn multiple times every year or whatever. If you think about how far some of these populations go upstream to get to their spawning area, it makes sense that you only want to go there once. Okay? Uh, a thousand kilometers is not unheard of in the salmon world that they're moving upstream. And in fact, if you go to Idaho, uh, the Stanley Basin, those fish have swum 14, 1500 kilometers to get up there. Nice big Chinook and steelhead. You only want to do that once. That's a lot of energy to get there. Um, if you consider and now know that you only spawn once, then you again appreciate Ray Trolls. Spawn till you die. Right? That's what happens. Okay, some terminology. Uh, we have nests. They, they dig nests. They lay the eggs in the nest. The uh, little fry or alevins hatch out. They turn into par where they have par marks. We end up with smolts. And smultification is adapting to saltwater. So it's pretty amazing that they're basically replumbing their physiology to go from freshwater to deal with saltwater, which is pretty major, major uh, restructuring chemically of the gills and how the gills work instead of, I can't remember which way it is. One of them, you're trying to keep the salt out. The other, you're trying to keep it the water out um, when they do that. Out in the ocean, spend some years out there. And then spawn is to reproduce, or a spawner is one who's spawning, and escapement is the number of spawners that come back and are allowed. So most of our rivers have escapement goals. So it's how many fish do you want to get into a particular stretch of river to produce the next generation. And I'll probably say escapement estimates or something. So that's what that's about. OK, so I provided some unifying characteristics. Uh, what's really amazing about Pacific salmon is that they all do it differently, the different species. So I'm providing here examples of age, uh, spawning locations, distributions, economic value. Um, so age at sexual maturity, here are kind of two extremes of what we see in Pacific salmon. King salmon have variable age at sexual maturation. So these are all sexually mature males. So this is what we call a mini jack. It's in its first year of life. It's basically a pair of gonads. Um, all the way down to a four-year-old adult. Okay, These are all sexually mature, and they can uh, contribute sperm. So when you're on the spawning grounds, you get some big males like this. It's very competitive. They're fighting each other for access to the females. And these little jacks can come in. And it's external fertilization, right? So they drop their lot wide at the right time. And they can actually, they found that uh, perhaps as many as 25% of the eggs get fertilized 
by jacks. So it's a, a pretty amazing strategy. The other extreme of this are pink salmon that essentially have a fixed two-year life history. So because of that, we have even in odd year runs that are genetically completely separate to the point that they might be considered uh, subspecies of each other. In some areas in the North Pacific, there's a huge dominance of one run over the other. Uh, Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia area, um, the odd year is the big one. So this year, the 17 return is huge. It's probably going to be, I don't know, 15 million fish. Last year, even year, that's the subdominant run, it was probably a few hundred thousand. So one, two orders of magnitude difference. Other areas, however, like um, Southeast Alaska, there's the two runs that even in the odds, they are separate, but they're more or less the same size. And they didn't think you could have three-year-old fish until for pink salmon until somebody stuck some in the Great Lakes. And then suddenly there were uh, three-year-olds. And we think it's just the productivity was a lot lower and it grows fast. And so they needed another year until they were sexually mature. Oops, excuse me. OK, so uh, another difference between salmon is that they spawn in different areas. You can see this is kind of a diagram of an uh, area like uh, we have around here where oops, we have some intermediate mountain range. Uh, the lowest spawners are the pink salmon. Up in Prince William Sound, they actually spawn in uh, saltwater areas. It's intertidal. Uh, chum salmon are also fairly low in systems. They say chum can't jump. And a relatively small waterfall is a barrier for chums. Coho like streams, uh, steelhead like even steeper streams, and then oh, where's my mouse? There, sockeye generally spend a year in a lake before they go out to sea. So they've specialized in these lakes. And I mentioned earlier that they'll return within meters of where they were born as adults. And sockeye that were came from reds below a lake go below the lake and they know to swim upstream to get in the lake. Those that are produced upstreams of lakes know to go downstream. And this is uh, hundreds or thousands of years of evolution providing that, that guidance. Uh, fall Chinook or Chinook in general have several different flavors. In fact, the Sacramento River has four separate uh, Chinook runs. Around here, we've got a lot of falls and spring Chinooks. Springs tend to be the upper reaches of rivers. Falls are the lower reaches of rivers. And the name comes from when they enter freshwater as adults. So spring Chinook come in in the spring. Fall Chinook come in in the fall. But they both actually spawn in the fall. And that means that these guys are holding for three to six months before they spawn. And they don't eat anything during that time. And that's why spring Chinook. Uh, John Williams, a guy who used to be a senior fisheries biologist uh, with NOAA Fisheries who worked on the Columbia, he said, Columbia River Spring Chinook is the best salmon in the world. And you imagine they come in and they have all these fat reserves because they've got to hold for that long. And they're just fantastic on the barbecue. Um, they're also, the Spring Chinook then wow. are sexually immature when they come in. They have what we call green eggs. Whereas the falls come in and they're ready to spawn right away. And there are also some other pretty major differences on how long they spend in fresh water before they go out, as well as where they are out in the ocean. So um, really interesting. And a lot of people spend a lot of time looking at this. OK, so where do these fish go? What is the southern end of the range? Since we're kind of south for a lot of salmon, this is just shows what the southernmost recognized population of the different species is. So here in Yaquina Bay, this is the southernmost recognized chum salmon population. Uh, Puget Sound is the southernmost pink population. Uh, sockeye go as far south as Redfish Lake in Idaho. This is one of these populations that's 1,400 kilometers upstream. Both Coho and Chinook, uh, historically, at least went as far as the Big Sur River down near Monterey Bay. And Steelhead used to go to uh, Baja. Right now, I think the southernmost population is somewhere in LA. Although with the drought they've been having, it's probably a little bit further north than that right now. Um, I should say that the, just because this is what we think is happening doesn't mean the fish pay attention to it. So uh, pink salmon, as I mentioned, they're, they're supposed to just go as far south as Puget Sound here. In 2011, we had this huge count. Almost 4,000 pinks got counted over Bonneville, which is the lowest of the Columbia River dams. They went all the way up into eastern Washington. This is like wine country. They're not, and they went as far south as Salinas Creek. 
uh, pink salmon were recovered there. We have no idea why. I was trying to get samples to look genetically and see where did these fish come from. Um, we were unsuccessful. But uh, they do whatever they want, despite what we think they're doing. So, a good. Yes, yes, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you never expand in the, if you're always going to the same place every time. OK, so what are some of the big populations we have? Uh, Bristol Bay sockeye is one of the biggies. Um, 30 million is the escapement uh, goal for uh, Bristol Bay. I mentioned sockeye like lakes. So Bristol Bay is actually this huge series of lakes uh, where you've got these hundreds of thousands of, of uh, salmon in them. Prince William Sound is known for its big pink salmon population. And I'll show you some hatchery data on that in a minute. Southeast Alaska has huge chum populations. Uh, the Fraser River is known for a big sockeye and a pink salmon population. Um, these are old numbers that uh, they've had a couple bad years, let's put it that way. Uh, Puget Sound has a, now has a huge pink salmon population. 15 years ago, it hardly had any. Uh, we get about a million coho come into Puget Sound. Columbia has on the order of half a million um, Chinook, and as does the Sacramento. So you can see there's kind of a decrease in numbers as you go down um, in range. OK, so what are the economic differences? Not only are these things biologically doing things differently, but we also put different values on them. So the biggie, the one you want to get is, if you're, especially if you're a commercial fisherman, are Chinook salmon. So they are the most valuable. I actually bought a salmon, Chinook salmon, spring Chinook, from some of the fishermen on the dock as a birthday present for my father. And it was the most expensive birthday present I have ever given him. Uh, they, they get a lot of money for those fish. Um, by contrast, pinks and chum, you can see they're, they're kind of making chump change. But these are huge, huge catches. So it's a valuable resource in the sense that there's a lot of quantity, but the quality isn't, isn't there. OK. so. Research and tools. Um, the primary management tool for Pacific salmon, uh, especially Chinook and Coho salmon, which are the two big value uh, species, are coated wire tags. These are these tiny little tags, and I was going to bring some with, and I forgot. Um, they put them in the nose, nasal cartridge, cartilage of the fish, usually at a hatchery before they go out. And people know to look for them in the fishery. Um, they, you can get thousands of fish that will all have the exact same tag code on the, the little piece of wire that's in there. You can take this number. There's an online database. Look it up. You know exactly where that fish came from, what hatchery, how big it was when it was released, what date. If it got moved, there's usually comments, et cetera. Um, this is the world's largest tagging program for any species. So 50 million tags are deployed every year, again, primarily in Chinook and Coho salmon. And about 250,000 of them are recovered every year. You have to dig the tag out of the nose, which means you've got to kill the fish to get it out. But usually that's what we're trying to do, right? You can't eat them if you don't kill them. Um, and read the tag and figure out uh, where it came from, whose fish it was, et cetera. Another big tool, particularly in the Columbia River, are pit tags. So these are just like the microchips that you put in your dog and cat. So each tag has a unique code. So you can follow individuals through the hydro system. The Columbia River is wired in that the ways that they want fish to go through the dams, whether you're going downstream or upstream, have detectors on them. They cost a lot more. These are about $2.40 a piece. And they have released, on average, this year, or the last couple of years, they're down to about 2 million tags annually they're releasing. Do the math. That's a huge amount just in the tags, let alone all the detectors that are in all the dams. But they are really, really cool. Um, an example of that is a steelhead here. That This is a map of the Columbia River showing the major dams. The steelhead was raised at Lyons Ferry Hatchery, uh, released in the Touche River in April. It was right near Walla Walla, Washington. It got detected at McDerry in uh, May. I caught it in our purse landing down in the mouth of the Columbia about 10 days later, and we measured it and released it. And from just this, you can see that you can calculate a travel speed. How fast is it going through? And this is actually pretty typical for interior stocks, that they're moving at 50, 60 kilometers a day. So they're moving pretty fast outstream. What is really cool about this fish, though, is that 
got detected at Bonneville Dam adult fish ladder a year after we caught it and released it. And then it got detected at McNary two week, or three months later, and then at the detection at the bridge, and then finally back at the river. And this is all remote. Nobody other than us, we handled it. Everything else was remote detections. So I don't know of any other tagging program that you can get this kind of uh, detections from. Um, and they do this for millions of fish literally every year. So it's very cool stuff. OK. The third big management tool we use with salmon is genetics. So this is where the homing comes in. Because these fish go back exactly where they came from, different populations are genetically very distinct because they're not straying like crazy. And so you can take a fish, catch it out in the ocean, and figure out where it came from. They essentially naturally tagged. Um, and they've ge um, genetically characterized thousands of populations. This is some examples, and I think this list is even bigger. These are Chinook populations that we have genetic data for. So we can go and use this as the baseline and compare a fish we catch somewhere else to and say, be able to say with confidence it came from such and such a place. So in the Columbia River alone, we can genetically uh, distinguish 10 Chinook populations, 8 steelhead populations, 3 sockeye populations, and then Idaho has been doing something called parental-based tagging, where they're uh, genotyping all the fish they use in their hatchery program, and then they make that information available. So if you know you have a, hat a hatchery fish from Idaho, you can look at that database and you can say, oh, here's, here are the adults. And as soon as you know who the parents were, then you know what hatchery it came from, when it was released, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of taking genetics one step further, which is really, really cool stuff. OK, issues. So, I have six issues here um, that are basically why thousands of biologists such as myself are employed. Okay, Hatcheries are uh, a way to bypass a lot of mortality that would naturally otherwise occur. So if you have adults, you run them through a hatchery system, there's about 10% mortality to get smolts that you then release and go out in the ocean and get big. In contrast, uh, somewhere between 50 and 90% uh, of the fish, the, if the eggs deposited turn into smolts. So you don't need very many adults to get the same number of smolts if you run them through a hatchery than if you let them stay out in the wild. And just for clarification, this is different than farm salmon where the entire life is in captivity. You're releasing hatchery fish to go out and get big out in the ocean so you don't have to feed them. Okay, some of the issues, hatchery fish don't survive in the wild as well as wild fish. Uh, there's also concerns about predator attraction. If you have release a bunch of fish, if you have wild fish in there, the seagulls know exactly what you're doing, uh, as do other, other predators. There's concerns about inbreeding with, between hatchery and wild fish reduces the wild uh, population fitness. And then harvest rates. Since if you run fish, fish through a hatchery, you don't need as many adults to make the next generation. It's easy to over-harvest wild populations. You can't harvest a wild population as hard as you can a hatchery population. And as I'll mention in just a second, we have mixed stock fisheries. Uh, to give you a sense of what hatchery production is like, this shows you this graph. Uh, it was put together a couple years ago, and, and uh, it's pretty staggering up in Alaska. Uh, pinks and chum, almost a billion fish. This is every year. These are annual estimates. Even though they have really good habitat, and pinks, what was that? 30 cents a pound for pinks, and they're releasing. A billion. Um, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, Southeast Alaska, half a half a million or a half a billion. Um, Columbia River is a big producer. 140 million hatchery fish come out of there or are produced there every year, mainly Chinook and Coho. So at least in the Columbia, they're producing high value fish. Okay, harvest. Uh, so one of the big issues is how many fish will return every year. That's the first step in, in managing salmon is trying to predict what's going to come back. And therefore, this, these salmon disasters uh, that are due to poor ocean conditions, which is I'm going to talk about a bit uh, coming up, is a, is a big deal. Um, some of the questions, and this is why we have things like Kodawar tags, is who's catching whose fish? Are the harvest rates sustainable for all populations? If we have listed fish um, listed under the ESA, Endangered Species Act, what happens to those in, in mixed stock fisheries. And then there's also issues of fisheries economics. So declining prices for wild fish, 
competition with farmed fish, um, et cetera, that, that gets complicated. OK, dams. Um, a lot of our rivers have large dams on them. They tend to block or restrict access to habitat, and they kill fish. People, fish that are trying to go up or down uh, takes them longer. They're more susceptible to predation, et cetera. Uh, in the Columbia, we, we have what we call high head dams, so they're big dams. I think uh, Ice Harbor is almost two, 200 feet tall, and it has fish ladders. So that's a long, that's a lot of steps an adult salmon would have to go up. And then we have these small bypass systems um, to sample fish as they're going down. They're kind of Rube Goldberg contraptions. Uh, and there's a lot of concrete, I should say. This is Grand Coulee Dam. It's probably the biggest one. No, no fish passes. I think this is, does anybody know what this is? It's like 500 feet tall, or it's something. It's huge. It was the largest concrete structure in North America when it was originally built. So, um, However, uh, the latest thing is removing dams, which is really cool. Uh, so this is the Elwha Dam, which is on the Olympic Peninsula up on the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Uh, this is what it looked like as they were taking it out. There's actually two dams on it. This is afterwards. And then this is showing this plume of what looks like a chocolate milkshake coming out because of all the silt that had been backed up behind the dam and it settled out. Um, so it's really exciting to see. And they have salmon have volitionally by themselves swum up past this area, both sockeye, uh, not sockeye, steelhead and schnook that I know of. And I think they've got chum going further up than they ever did. And it's really cool with this one as well. Uh, this is an aerial photograph taken last fall. And you can see how the mouth of the Elwha is now filling in. They're getting sand build up, and it's really changing. It was these these beaches were really starved for sand because it wasn't getting through uh, because of the dams. It's now now doing that, and it's really exciting to see. And fish are taking advantage of this new habitat. Things like surf smelt and herring, uh, sand lance are spawning in this now. Okay, ESA listings uh, endangered species is one that's at risk of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of range, and a threatened species is likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. This figure shows you where we've got listed uh, salmon populations. So there are currently 26 ESUs, or evolutionarily significant units, that receive protection under the ESA, uh, five endangered, 21 threatened. Basically, the further south or the further in-stream, upstream you go, uh, the more listed populations. Here on the coast, coho salmon are listed uh, under the ESA. The issues are how do you define recovery? Um, what does it look like, and how do you get there? And there's a huge amount of effort that's being done. And this has a really big impact on what you can do to our streams, to our forests, et cetera, to the landscape um, it, it comes in. OK, ocean conditions. This is the best part, so stay tuned. Uh, we're going to take a big tangent, but it's, it's going to be fun. Um, <laughs> ocean conditions. So most salmon that enter the ocean don't make it back. Okay, we think about 5% survival is very typical. Whether you're a pink salmon up in Alaska, a redfish lake sockeye, uh, if you're above 5%, it's pretty unusual. A huge amount of this is these ocean conditions, changes in the conditions the fish find out in the ocean, which influence things like prey availability, competitor abundance, or predator abundance. Um, so the issues are really that there's high variability in marine survival it means it's high variability in the number of fish returning. And for managers, trying to predict how many are going to come back is kind of the first step. Uh, to illustrate that, uh, this is coho marine survival. We have up in Alaska uh, in the 90s, it was huge, huge survival. So with 20% survival, that means that for every five smolts that go to the ocean, you get one adult back. Compare that at the same period to this uh, Oregon coast and Columbia River survival, which was about half a percent. That means that it takes 200 smolts to get one fish, one adult back. So if you're a manager, you obviously want to be up here. But the problem is, is that it changes from year to year, and you're trying to predict it. And so uh, our group that's here at, at Hatfield is really trying to look and learn what are good ocean conditions, what are bad ocean conditions. And especially nowadays, the past doesn't always help you predict the future. OK, so it's been really exciting the last couple of years because of this thing called the worm blob, the El Nino, the La Nina. 
and what they're doing to the North Pacific, the habitat that these salmon are using. So before I delve into this, I'm going to talk about anomalies. Anomalies are just the t uh, values with the seasonal or monthly time series removed. So you subtract off the mean for that month or day or whatever. You get If it's below average, you get negative anomalies. Po uh, if it's above average, you get positive anomalies. OK, so to start with the blob, you have to understand that what winter storms do around here. We have big winter storms across the North Pacific, and they mix the surface water column. OK, uh, really big winds. And what that does is it brings this cold, nutrient-rich water up into the photic zone, which is nutrient-poor because all the phytoplankton use it up. And at the same time, you're transferring heat down as you're moving nutrients up. And then there's also a lot of transfer of heat up into the atmosphere. You imagine cold winds off Siberia go out over the ocean, and a lot of the heat gets transferred. What happened in 2013-14 is that we had this unusually high pressure that was stationary over the North Pacific. These are actually atmospheric pressure anomalies. Okay, they're high. They're above, way above average. And this thing was just parked out in the North Pacific. And all those storms that normally run, run through that area didn't come. So we didn't have strong winds. We didn't have transfer. Uh, we didn't have nutrients either. And it kept the water from cooling and becoming more nutrients. Okay, so that's one thing that happened out there. The other is El Ninos and La Ninos. So uh, El Ninos and La Ninos are tropical phenomena. They occur at the equator of the Pacific. El Ninos are warm. La Ninos are cold. You measure them in this little as sea surface temperature anomalies in this box. This is Mexico, South America here. This is Australia down there. Uh, they measure them as temperature anomalies. The 15, 16 El Nino was one of the largest on record. So this is the temperature anomaly in this little box starting in July of 2015 uh, through June of 2016. The high point was in November of 2015. Um, this is the highest single weekly value ever recorded for a El Nino. This thing was huge. Okay, and then we had a La Nina in 1516. So this is the same temperature anomaly in the same little box, except now it's negative. Um, and this is going from April 16 to March of this year. And you can see it was pretty weak. Uh, it wasn't very negative. didn't last very long. But these two things are out there, as I will show you in a second. OK, so these are sea surface temperature anomalies across the North Pacific. Uh, it starts in October of 2013. This is North America. This is Russia over here. And time goes down all the way to July of 2016. Um, you can see then the blob starts in November 2013. It's apparent because these winds are not are getting blocked by the high pressure. We're not getting any mixing. We're not getting the cooling, and we're not getting the nutrients up into the photic zone as well. You can see this blob continues and slowly spreads over time. Uh, we also get the peak of the El Nino. This is the equator down here. You can see it's really, really red, so it's really warm, but you know, throughout the North Pacific, it's been warm uh, in this time period. And then here the La Nina begins in June of 2013. So we're starting to get cold water now on the equator. If you move forward with that, uh, these are the more recent sea surface temperature anomaly data. You can see here's the peak of this week, La Nina, in 2016, October of 2016. And you can also see that the blob is gone. Here's November of 2016. Last fall, it was very, very stormy. We had repeated storms, and it cooled that water off like it normally should. It was mixing it up. But throughout this whole thing, it's been warm, both in the Gulf of Alaska and along our coast here. Salmon are a cold water species. They don't like warm water. It has not been good. This is earlier this week. This is the current sea surface temperature anomaly. You can see some bits of cold water out there, but it's still been warm along our coast. Um, it's great for sardines and other species, not necessarily. So what has happened because of all this warm water out there? And I should say it's, it's not just the water temperature. It's whole ecosystems that are associated with it. Um, the response has been huge. Um, so things like Mola Mola's up in southeast Alaska uh, that are new to that. Um, what I'm going to do is go through quick 
some of the changes that notable changes that we've seen. One of the big ones is off the coast here. We've seen a really dramatic change in the jellyfish community starting in 2015. We used to always get tons of these Chrysaeora sea nettles. And in 15 and 16, it switched to water jellies, Acriora instead. It looks like perhaps they're going back uh, in this year to a more normal situation. Some of the other gelatinous creatures um, that have been unusual are doliolids. These are normally found hundreds of kilometers offshore. Uh, 15 and 16 got really high abundance on the shelf. And in February of this year, out 200 kilometers, they were so thick you could walk on their backs. So uh, we're not sure why these things are happening, where they're blooming, where their distributions are changing, but they are, and it's notable. Uh, the big one that's been in the news lately are these pyrosomes. These are a pelagic colonial tunicate. Again, they're normally hundreds of kilometers offshore. Pelagic species at relatively low abundances. They've been washing up on beaches uh, the spring and summer. There was a big outbreak this winter up in Sitka. All the troll fishery was catching uh, pyrosomes instead of salmon. And uh, I just had to show this video. This is at 100 meters depth, 65 kilometers offshore in May. And those are all pyrosomes. Oh, man, it's kind of funky. Sorry for the quality. It, it worked better when I had it earlier. Anyway, there's, there's thousands of them out there. And we have no idea why or what they're doing, what the effect is. But you can't put that much biomass into an ecosystem without it having to make some room for itself. Um, so we don't know what's going on. Other unusual sightings in 2015, we had tropical species that came up because this is when the blob was, that really, really warm water. Uh, a school of swordfish got caught off the Oregon coast, triggerfish off Vancouver Island. This is an opa. This is a tropical species off the Oregon coast uh, showed up. We had range extensions, thresher sharks, mola mola, skipdak tuna found in Alaska. This is the first time ever they've been seen that far north. Uh, we had humpback whales come into the Columbia River estuary for the first time. We think they were following the anchovies in because uh, it was so warm outside. The anchovies didn't want to be out there either. Wasn't much else to eat. When our juvenile salmon surveys, the fish were incredibly skinny. We don't think they survived. Uh, southern copepods dominated off our the Oregon coast and 15 species that Bill Peterson counts these. He'd never seen them before in 20-year data series. Um, and then we had a lot of warm water species found off the coast that were either earlier or more abundant than normal. Uh, 16, it continues. Rockfish, salmon weren't skinny. Uh, we ended up with red pelagic crabs here in Newport. These guys belong off Baja. And they ended up on the beach one day. We still had southern species. Humpback whales are now in San Francisco Bay, too, which is also unusual, as well as the Columbia. And again, the same mix of unusual species, and a lot of most ever seen for some of the rarer species. This year, as I mentioned, it looks like we're starting to get the normal uh, jellyfish returning. Uh, humpbacks are already in San Francisco Bay. Our abundances of juvenile salmon were extremely low, which is a huge cause for concern. The pyrosomes exploded. And again, this warm water mix of, of fish off the shelf. Okay. So uh, salmon are really good indicators of what's going on in the ocean because they go out in the ocean, swim around, get affected by ocean conditions. And then when they come back, we count them very, very carefully and have really precise estimates of how many come back to each population. So uh, that unlike any other marine species that's there where you don't know if you have a 10% increase or decrease in population, salmon, we know if we have a 1% increase or decrease in the population. So one of the, the big things that happened in 2015 is the Fraser and Salish Sea, uh, and I should say that, which includes Puget Sound, were extremely low abundance, small body size, and fecundity. And this is where management had issues. They didn't realize that this has happened. They were predicting a regular return. They started fishing them. And then kind of before it was too late, they said, oops, stop fishing, emergency closures. The Skagit River normally has a return of about 100,000 coho. They ended up with 9,000. So they're going to see the effects of this. These are three-year-old fish, uh, three years from 2015. So next year, they're going to have a low return, and perhaps the next generation as well. So this is huge, huge deal. And this was a real wake-up call for a lot of salmon managers. We're into new territory for, for some of our fish. 
Uh, we also saw very low returns um, on the Oregon coast and the Columbia River as well, the lowest we've seen since the 90s. Um, but at the same time, the Chinook returns are actually really high. So different species, because they use the ocean slightly differently and go to the ocean at different times doing different things, um, and extremely low downstream survival of Central Valley and uh, Chinook and Steelhead because of the drought. And in fact, this year, there's a big closure in the ocean right now in southern Oregon because of the Klamath, which is just north of there, um, because they think the ocean abundance is incredibly low. So uh, in 16, so one year later, the pinks were the lowest, Alaska pinks were the lowest returns in memory. Um, and go figure, the Fraser recorded both the lowest return on record for sockeye, less than a million fish for the first time ever, and also one of the highest chum returns in the exact same year. So uh, job security, as we say. And then initial returns so far this year in 17, uh, extremely low spring chinook, sockeye, and steelhead in the northwest. These are all fish that went out in 15 in the blob in that all that warm water and unusual conditions. Uh, we told people it was going to happen, and it did. OK, so just three more slides, I think. Uh, one is climate change. So as we all know, unless you're the president, the climate is getting warmer. <laughs> so this is global temperatures. 15 and 16 are kind of off the charts. Uh, not sure what we're going to do with 17. Here in the Northwest, we think that by 2040, uh, the air and stream temperatures are going to increase by about 2 degrees Celsius. And this is just showing uh, by season temperature <laughs> increases. These are two different models, but you can see the, the summers are especially going to get a lot warmer. And this has a huge impact on our snowpack. So we don't have reservoirs around here that, you know, lakes, we have snowpack in the mountains. And when it's warmer, we don't have as much snow. 2016 or 15, 14, 15, winter of 2014, 15 was a perfect example of that. It was a little bit warmer. It rained like it normally does, and we ended up with almost no snowpack because it was too warm. That two to three degrees makes all the difference in the world. Um, so that was kind of a, a heads up of what's going to come. They also are expecting warmer or drier summers and wetter winters. So this is precipitation. And you can see a decrease in precipitation in the summer and more at other uh, times of year. And ocean temperatures are expected to rise one to two degrees as well. So what is that going to do to Pacific salmon? Salmon are a cold water species. If you increase the temperatures everywhere they go in their life cycle, it's going to be warmer, and that's added stress. Okay, It's not good. They're going to be more uh, susceptible to diseases or parasites, et cetera. There's also going to be oops, uh, increased interactions with southern species. So just like we saw in 2015 with all these tropical species coming up because the water's warm, that's what's going to happen. We're going to get more, and a lot of those are predatory fishes, um, as well as differences in, in, uh, at all trophic levels. So we're going to get uh, copepods and, and other things uh, coming in. And then I think particularly important for salmon, because they have these complex lifestyle or life cycles, is this opportunity for timing mismatches, because they're moving from one habitat to the other. And if they get cues about when to move downstream or out into the ocean, that are wrong because the stream is now warmer than it used to be, they're going to out the, end out in the ocean at times when they shouldn't be there, or they're going to come back at times when it's too warm. And we kind of saw that in 2015 when they think that about 90% of the sockeye that came into the Columbia was a huge return, half a million fish. They think that 95% of them died before they even made it to their home stream because the water was so warm. So the, they need to adjust the timing, and it's not clear how well that's going to go down. OK, in freshwater, because of the changes in stream flows, uh, or snowpack, we expect higher stream, summer temperatures, lower flows, and then higher flows due to intense storms in the winter, which is going to cause debris flows, egg scouring, et cetera. It's not good. Um, and then finally, in the ocean, that uncertain effects of productivity in marine waters. Um, here in the California current, our offshore water, the, our offshore waters are driven by upwelling, which is a pressure difference in atmospheric pressure, causes the winds to blow, just like today. Um, and it's not clear what's going to happen to that pressure difference. The current climate models cannot resolve that and tell you what's really going to happen. Um, up in Alaska, however, if you warm things up, it tends to get more productive. So that's a good plus, but um, not great. OK, so where to learn more? There's a bunch of books. 
uh, lots of websites, etc. There's actually one that's just coming out. I'll put in a plug for it. Uh, Marine Ecology of Pacific Salmon Steelhead, although that's not the proper name. Do you know what the name is, Rick, for that? Anyway, is it? Yeah, Salmon Ocean Ecology. I don't know. It's coming out any day now, um, which will be really cool. Uh, big volume describing what's going on with salmon in the ocean. And finally, <coughs> put in my plug, if anybody wants to help cut fish, uh, next Tuesday at 8.30 over in the Berry Fisher Building, we'll, we're going to have a bunch of the fish that we caught out in the ocean this spring. We need to necropsy them. It's a good time. We'll tell you everything you need to learn. Provide all your cutting gear. Look at smiling Hillary. Wasn't it fun? It was great. Yeah. So if you want to help out, we'll take you. Uh, it would be great if you would RSVP to Kim Jacobson with a Y um, at NOAA.gov and just let her know you're coming. Uh, that'd be great. It will be a day of fun. And with that, I will stop. Questions? Yeah. Well, you should see some of these warmer water adapted creatures moving north. Is there any indication that there's ratcheting where they move up and they don't go back? Particularly about humble Certainly, with the the jack and the Pacific mackerel, they have been here now for five years. So they came up and they. Hopefully, eventually, whenever we get cold water again, they will move back down. But we definitely see that, that they come up and they tend to stay. Uh, I heard a description, it's kind of a hangover effect. Um, whether they stay permanently or not, that's a good question. Uh, potentially, they might. If, it, if, it, if we don't get cold water again, they'll, they'll stay up here. Uh, for some species, it's great. Sardines, you know, they moved up. Uh, the can Canadians have been fishing on them for I don't know how long, last 10 years or something like that? Nobody's fishing on them now. Now, right now, but they have uh, been, yeah. Yeah, so they had been completely gone from Canadian waters for 30, 40 years, and then in the last 10 years they've been fishing on. They, the sardines have come all the way back up again. Um, I'm hearing about Humboldt, so we went to Kodiak Island. Yeah, in 2005. That, crashes yeah, that yeah. Happens. I've also heard that with the Humboldt, um, that they have reverted into this, according to Kelly Beno Bird, that they've reverted into this very quick maturing non migratory form. So they're sexually mature at six months instead of two years. And so they're staying uh, in southern waters. And I'm waiting for them. I, I thought we'd get them back with all this warm water. I thought for sure we'd see some Humboldts. Uh, they haven't made it back yet. But we're certainly seeing that with other species that are appear to be here to stay at least for a while. Yeah. While, yeah. So, you know, yeah. Big, big there. Yeah. 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 And the sardines are spawning up here. They didn't used to spawn up here, but um, they are. I mean, we're getting eggs off the coast in on the Newport line. Um, they're supposed to be spawning in Southern California. So, yeah, things are changing. John. So the half of one percent survival of the cohort in the Southern Range versus the one in twenty in the Northern Range. Do and you listed several different factors that could create that difference, but how well are any of those factors known? Predation versus you know, play. So I will give you a copy of my dissertation because that's <laughs> what it was kind of about. What we what I think personally is that the reason uh, Southeast Alaska was incredibly productive there for a stretch of years, and the coho were incredibly well fed. Um, and if you compared, I, I looked at 500 stomachs as part of my dissertation. I found three that were empty. If you look off the, at the same period off the Washington, Oregon coast here, typically 15, 20% of the stomachs were empty, okay, versus like 0.02% or whatever it is. I mean, so the, clearly the conditions for feeding were really, bottom up was really good. And then in Southeast Alaska, coho and Chinook are a relatively small proportion of the salmon. Uh, biomass, Z order magnitude more abundant sockeye, pinks, and chump that are all smaller than the coho. Coho go out as yearlings, those others go out as subs. And so, and the coho go out at the same time. And so I think they had this great feeding conditions and this killer predation buffer, and they just bloomed. And, and uh, even though they were eating relatively low quality prey, um, it was perfect conditions. 
So, and in the 90s, that's when um, poor feeding conditions here, probably a lot of predatory fishes, that's when the first kind of wave of, of mackerel came up. Um, so the opposite. But I'll give you a copy, of, send you a copy of my dissertation. Yeah. Sorry you asked that, huh? <laughs> uh, so Lori, the whole hatchery thing is kind of, I think, different. It's difficult for those outside to understand. What proportion of commercial and, or recreational fisheries is dependent on the hatchery system across the whole Pacific? So uh, I don't know what it is across the whole Pacific. In the Columbia River, uh, I've estimated of juveniles going downstream, about 90% of the juveniles going downstream are hatchery fish. And I think it's 80 or 90% of the adults that get caught coming into the Columbia are hatchery fish. Uh, in southeast Alaska, like Prince William Sound, where they have all the pink, re pink releases, again, 90, 95% of those are hatchery. 99% of the wild 90. fishery is dependent on hatchery stuff. Yeah. So, and I, I had some definitions in here. In Alaska, if a fish has gone to the ocean, regardless of whether it was raised in a hatchery or a stream, it's called a wild fish because it's gone to the ocean. And so if you look at any fish that, like you go over to local ocean, you want to buy, it says wild Alaskan, this and that, even though it's probably a hatchery fish. And they don't mark them up there, so they can't tell what's going on. It's huge. And they're, 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 the really scary one is in Russia, that they are greatly expanding. It's primarily pink and chum hatcheries, and they are greatly exp expanding them. In Japan, there's chum fisheries. It's probably 99% hatchery fish. They have almost no wild production, and Russia is trying to get there. Um, so it's, it's huge. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting to mention about how we're sort of carrying the past in the ocean because we're putting out all these fish that may even see what we're doing. Yeah. Actually, and you see that in pinks, but they've got to have the three year cycle. You can look at some of the other species that the coral are around the sea. You actually see a drop in the growth rate or survival when the, during the peak. Yeah. Um, they, they get this weird growth pattern every other year. They're a stronger creature. So, yeah, and and in fact, there's now they've they've seen that in seabird colonies in Alaska that they can see a very clear even odd because again the pink salmon in Asia, which is the big population, have a really strong even odd year class difference, like in that order of magnitude stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they do, they generally do pretty good, um, depending on how long you leave them there. If you move them around a lot, then they don't know where they're going to go to. And that's one of the problems, one of the big problems in the Columbia is that they barge fish. Because of all the dams in the Snake River, they pick them up at Lower Granite, which is almost to Idaho, and they dump them out below Bonneville. And so they bypass them. They literally put them in barges. I mean, you go up in the spring, up in the gorge, and you'll see the, the salmon barges go by. And so you've removed all those cues, so they think it's mainly olfaction, that they're smelling their way downstream. And then they found that the barge fish have more problems trying to figure out where home is than the fish that have spent that time actually in river. Or if you're moving around, you know, you raise them in one hatchery, you transfer them to a completely different basin for whatever reason, and then release them somewhere else. They don't know where they're going uh, when they come back. So that, that's a huge concern with hatchery fish. And generally, the hatcheries have really reformed their practices. They don't move them around. They don't give other people fish. Uh, they're trying to use primarily uh, locally derived fish for their hatchery stocks. So, yeah. Just a quick comment about all those hatchery fish up north of the Pacific. They're very cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And they're all chums and pinks, which have a wide history with just sort of being. Go out, out. Yeah, no, that's a good point. But it's like, like you know, why, why even do that? That's really the question. Uh, if you're impacting, I mean, because the, the data, like, like Rick was talking about, Bristol Bay Sockeye, I mean, they've estimated that they would get. 
I can't remember what it is. It's in the millions more sockeye back if there weren't so many pink salmon out there in the years that they're competing with them. It's impacting the sockeye, which is a much more valuable population. And we see that even in Puget Sound with uh, Chinook salmon. If you, because we have this really strong even on here, you look at the survival of Chinook and Puget Sound, it goes down in the years where there's lots of pinks versus the years that there's not. So it's not benign. Even though those fish don't cut up catch cost a lot, they're impacting this ecosystem that all different populations of salmon are are well, using. The, the fishermen out in Alaska are getting green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I know people who have looked at that in the Sailor Sea and tried to figure out why the evens and the odds are so, and they have not been able to figure out what it is. But a lot of times, like sockeye, with their, we have a dominant year class like we do in the Fraser, they impact the zooplankton in the lakes. And so the next you know, year class, there's not much to eat, et cetera. And you can see these really clear feedbacks. Um, with a, even on audience, I don't think anybody has really figured out how to play that. I don't know if you know. Yeah. 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 Hillary, do you have a question? I think it's carryover from the blog, I'll tell you the truth. Um, so the, the line media was really weak. I mean, it was almost non-existent. It just barely qualified as a line media. Um, and that's actually, I, you know, kind of we're, we're looking at these things in real time and you're trying to figure out what, 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 what actually happened. And I think five years from now, people will have a better idea of what really happened, you know, what the mechanisms were. Um, my sense is that, I mean, it, it looks like on some ways that the North Pacific is kind of returning to normal. Um, and it's really surprising that the catches were so low in, in, in the Gulf of Alaska. Our colleague from the Alaska Fishery Science Center has been sampling in the Gulf of Alaska, um, and he got no Chinook. And normally he catches primarily Cumbria River Chinook up there. They weren't there, and he also gets a lot of pinks, and there weren't any pink juvenile pink salmon. So it's a huge cause for concern for what's really going on. So, yeah. Let me get somebody else, right? Yeah, I was going to do I did not, but I have a picture of it. <laughs> so the PDO is this, uh, it's, a, it's a pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies across the North Pacific that, that Nate Mantua, who was a really smart guy, figured out. Um, and he found that there were these kind of two different patterns, what we call the warm phase, where it's warm on our coast, and then the cool phase, where it's cool along our coast. And, it's the Pacific decadal oscillation because there's about 10 year cycles, decadal cycles of it switching back and forth. It has fallen apart. So, so this pattern no longer exists. Um, and it's getting really screwy numbers because it doesn't look like this anymore. I mean, if you go and look at our. Where's my SST? That doesn't look like the PDO. None of this looks like the PDO. So it's really falling apart. It used to be a good predictor of what was going on, but uh, since the blog, it's not. It's, it's, we're, something else is that this characteristic pattern has really fallen apart. So, yeah. Good question. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. How long does he have the, the pattern for the PDO? How far back does that go? It's a couple hundred years, so they're able to reconstruct it from like tree ring data. Oh. So the PDO, um, it, is, uh, it affects our temperature and our precipitation levels around here. So when we have a this cool phase, the negative phase, it tends to be, we tend to have cool wet winters and the trees grow really fast. In the positive phase, they warm and it's dry and they don't grow as fast. And so you can be, reproduce it um, a couple hundred years back in time. 
and shown that uh, it used to be that salmon um, were actually really correlated with the PDO. In fact, that's one of the, in his 97 paper that he described as a big part of it with salmon and this kind of out of phase between Alaska populations and the Northwest population um, that he was describing with the PDO. But it's, it's fallen apart on Alaska. So it's a lot. It, it, it's just describing a pattern. I mean, it's not a mechanism. It's just, just he found that there are these two patterns that it seems to flip back and forth between the two, and now we're into strange, strange territory. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's variability in the sizes of the turtles that we see in the field. There's also is there been variability in the trends in size of adults? Size of adults. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the big ones was this um, in the 2015 return of uh, Coco to Puget Sound. Now. This was here. They were extremely small and small bodied. Um, and one of the concerns with that is that uh, fecundity is an exponential function with size of the fish. So a big female has lots of eggs and she has big eggs. A slightly smaller female has a lot fewer eggs and smaller eggs. And so when your escapement estimate is based on how many eggs or how many you're using it as fish to get the eggs in there, and you have small fish, it makes a big difference. There, I didn't mention it, but also in 2015, the Ocean Age 3 sockeye, the Bristol Bay, were tiny. Okay, okay. So they're, 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 they're really happy. Happy. Uh, like, like, larger. Yeah, yeah. and in fact, like, this year, they're, it looks like they're, they're big yet again, even bigger than they were. In, and they're, they're, in fact, they're talking right now on whether some of the pinks coming back to Alaska are actually trees instead of two. That, that they're so big um, that something's going on. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's one of these that's evolving right now. People are noticing, it's like, these fish are huge. Are these really two-year-old fish? Um, you know, and I haven't heard, uh, I have a colleague at ADFG who keeps me up abreast of everything, and he's just noticing it, you know, and we're waiting to hear what, what the answer was. He was also seeing a lot of zero-age, zero, yeah, zero-age stockpile returning to Alaska this, this summer. So they've gone out to zeros and spending, instead of spending a year in a lake, they went right out. And that's what starts to return, which is also unusual. Uh, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will talk. I yeah. love. But uh, in respect to everybody's time, I'm sure Lori will be more than happy to answer any more of the questions we have up here. But let's give Lori a hand for her singing for you.